We're fast approaching a zero hour where if you're a prepper, it's going to be time to put your plans into action. But what happens if disaster strikes when you're not at home? And in all likelihood, that's the way it's going to go down. What do you do if you're away from home and you need to get back? What if your car is inoperable? What if highways are impassable? In this video, I'm going to be talking about a few very critical items you need to start taking with you whenever you're on the road, and also some incredibly important but very easy to learn skills that'll make sure that wherever you are when disaster strikes, you can get back home. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. We're getting to the end of the summer driving season, but many of us might have one or even two road trips left in us. And between that fact and the fact that organizations that are con very conservative with their warnings when it comes to these types of things, even organizations like the federal government have been issuing warnings that people need to be ready for major disruptive events. Things like power grid failure, things like terrorism is always a perennial favorite, even things as extreme sounding as electromagnetic pulse events, which could shut down the power grid, shut down traffic lights, even shut down many people's vehicles. Because of that fact, I wanted to talk in this video about things that I carry in my car, things that I would recommend that you carry in your car, whether you're going on an extended trip, a vacation or something like that, or even going back and forth to the office. Because as preppers, when we're away from home, that's probably when we're the most vulnerable. So I wanted to go over some of the things that I have in my vehicle to make sure that if any event happened like that, I would have the best chances possible, not a guarantee, but the best chances possible to get home back to my family get home back to where you know most of my preparedness uh, plans are intended to be carried out. It all starts with the tires. The tires are where the rubber meets the road, literally, and it's really important to be able to repair a flat tire. I know for many people in our society, the way they repair a flat tire is to get on their phone and call for help. But that's not necessary. It's never the most cost-effective way of solving the problem. And in an emergency situation, that might not even be possible. So it's really important that you have the ability, at the very least, to solve that problem on your own. I'm not going to get into the nuts and bolts of exactly how to change a tire. There are plenty of videos here on YouTube where you can check that out. But some of the items that you want to make sure that you have in your car, if you are going to be capable of changing a tire, is you're going to want to have some kind of a jack. Now, most vehicles come with a car jack. Uh, I have one back in the... Uh, bottom of my back bed here. Most uh, vehicles come with that, but you want to make sure that maybe you bought a used vehicle and the jack was removed at some point. Make sure you have a jack. Once you get the car jacked up, let's say there's some kind of a nail or something in there, you want to be able to pull the nail out. So you're going to want to have multi-tool pliers or something along those lines. We can remove the nail and then you're going to want to be able to patch that up. A tire patch kit, which includes tools like this. This is for roughing up the hole and this is for putting a plug in is really important to have. The plugs that are used with this kind of system, they look like little bits of beef jerky here. You take one of these, slide it into this device here, put a little bit of this kind of goop glue on it, you plunge it down into the hole, uh, you wait a couple of seconds, I forget, it's been a while since, <laughs> since I did it. Yeah, you wait a couple of seconds or a couple of minutes for it to cure, cut the top off, you wanna have a knife in your car, and then you can mount the tire back on and you're good to go. If you ever have a kit like this and you use some of it, you should know that uh, the, the glue in these kind of tubes tends to dry up once they've been opened. So you wanna make sure you have a fresh tube so that you don't open up your kit and find out that your, your glue tube is completely all caked up. That gives you the ability to get the tire off, to patch a tire, to put the tire back on, and get yourself back on the road again. The one thing that's missing, however, is how to inflate the tire back up. And I've got a couple different ways of doing that, and I mean, they're pretty academic. One of them is right here, and this is actually the motivation of this video. I was sent this item uh, for free by the company. They asked me to do a review, and I said, well, I don't really want to do a review. Maybe I will include it in a video that's a little bit more important than just a review of a air pump. Now, I am going to get into the details of how all this works, and it is an awfully nice pump, and it also does a lot of other things, too. But I want to talk about some other options uh, that you could use as well. This unit here. It's just a small uh, air pump that you can keep in your car. It's made by a company called Hyper Tough. Doesn't sound hyper tough to me, but it's worked for me for many years. And uh, it's nice to have some way of just reinflating a tire. This one just has a simple uh, you know, on-off button and you just kind of watch the pressure and bring the pressure back up to where tires are supposed to be. Uh, we're going to do this one last. The other option is just 
a bike pump. You could have a bike pump in your car. Now, uh, you know, I know if for a lot of people that aren't gearheads, I myself wasn't a gearhead um, and I, I'm still not. Uh, you know, when I first started driving, I was like, well, is a, would a bike pump work? You know, bikes are smaller than cars. Would a bike pump not be powerful enough? Actually, the pressure that's required for bike tires is usually higher than the pressure that's re required for car tires. So yes, a bike pump is totally fine. It takes a lot of pumping, but you can totally just fill up your tires with a bike pump. And this doesn't, well, it has many fewer moving parts than these kind of things, and it's much less prone to failure than electronic things. So this is a really nice fallback. Now it's kind of big. There are smaller bike pumps. The thing with smaller bike pumps is that they have less volume of air. So while it takes a lot of pumping to get a car tire filled up with a, a, a bike pump like that, with a small bike pump, and I have I literally done this before, it takes a lot, a lot of pumping with a little bike uh, pump. But if you want to just have a small one, just as an absolute fail safe in, in case, you know, other uh, more technological electronic uh, devices fail, I think that's not a bad idea to have. If you are gonna have a electronic uh, pump, pump, this uh, Eaton Wolf pump, I really think, uh, yeah, it, it, it's a heck of a lot nicer than this, mostly because it's got a battery in it. This one I have to plug in, and it's kind of a pain when I'm to topping off all my tires. This one has uh, just a battery in it, and it's, it's a lot easier to move around. Uh, it has a lamp on it, uh, which can do like uh, strobing, and it can also do SOS. You know, the utility, Really of that I think is kind of limited. It's like, how many situations are you going to be in when you're going to be flashing off an SOS, like when you're next to the side of the road. I think if you're broken down on the side of the road, it's probably kind of obvious that you need help anyway, but they do have that op, uh, function where you can make a little SOS or a strobe, at least for safety, the strobe could alert people uh, in the area that you're working there. So that could be kind of a safety feature, certainly. Uh, it also can uh, be used on all sorts of different things, not just for cars. It can be used for cars, for bikes. Uh, well, they've got a whole menu in here that I'll bring up. You can fill up uh, sports balls and things like that. Um, and it also can be used for filling up air mattresses or deflating air mattresses. It has this low pressure hose here that goes into the side. And this it has a uh, deflate and, and inflate side. And you can use that to quickly inflate or deflate a, an air mattress. So there's a lot of utility there. Uh, this is the high pressure hose for actually filling up uh, car tires, bike tires, things like that. Uh, in the back, and this is actually, this is a really cool feature uh, that they have this on here. There's a little USB power port. So not only is this a way of filling up your tires or whatever, it's also a way of um, yeah, having some backup power, like, you know, for running your cell phone or something like that. So uh, overall, I think this is a pretty cool device. Uh, it, it's, uh, I've been, you know, using it on and off for the last couple of weeks, and it, it seems like it's holding up fine. Now, I think the real test of things like this is, you know, how many years is it gonna uh, last? But, you know, just the feel of this thing, it feels really rugged. This thing should be called hyper tough. This thing's like a little, uh, you know, chintzy piece of plastic, but that's held up for a long time. I'd be really surprised if this doesn't hold up for a long time. So overall, I would uh, definitely recommend if you're looking for something like this uh, to get the Eaton Wolf because, uh, you know, it feels rugged. It's got a lot of um, different functionalities in there and you can see you, they've got a place to store all of your different tips. So you now en enough on that. You want to be able to fill up your uh, car tires when you're on the road. And again, I would highly recommend, even if you have a nice uh, electronic one like this, have some kind of a, a physical backup. Even if it's not a big one like that, just get yourself a small one. It'll be a, a real pain in the butt if you ever actually had to use it, but I mean, it may be your only option at some point. So get yourself a, a little bike pump as well. I'm gonna put links down in the description below uh, to all the things that I'm talking here. In this in particular, because they kind of, they didn't sponsor the video, but they gave it to me for free. So th uh, this will be down there as well. Uh, other things that are important, uh, you know, once you get your car uh, functional and it's ready to move again, I think it's really important to have maps. And a lot of people rely on the maps on their phone, like their GPS device. And uh, those kind of maps are great and they're useful, but they do have limitations. Uh, in particular, a lot of maps like Google Maps are relying, you know, well, at the time of this recording, maybe Google's changed it, but the last time I checked, Google Maps needed that uh, internet connection to, uh, to get different maps for different areas. If you're moving through an area, if it doesn't have the connection, it, you're not gonna be getting your uh, fresh maps. There are apps that you can put on your phone. Uh, one is called Maps. I think M-E, it's maps dot something something. I'll put a link down in the description below and uh, or a graphic up here on the screen uh, so you know that one. That's a really nice app because that allows you to pre-download maps. So you can download maps when you have internet connection. They can be really detailed maps down to like individual street level. Uh, they even have uh, trails 
So you can, you know, let's say you're on a road and you want to get over to some other road, you could actually see hiking trails. So if you weren't going to take a road, you could just hike from one road to another and kind of bridge that way. A lot of detail you can get into there and you can get it all on your phone and it does not need an active working internet connection. So if the entire grid went down and all you have is the information that's on your phone, you're going to have the information there. But I would not stop there. I would definitely recommend get yourself some good paper maps. When you're navigating around using a map, it's important to understand the layout of the landscape around you, and that's where the map comes in. But it's also critical to understand your relationship to that landscape. And that's where it becomes really important to understand the cardinal directions of north, south, east, and west. Now, an easy way of knowing which direction is north is using a compass. And lots of people travel around with compasses all the time. I'm one of them. I keep one of them in my EDC pack. But if I didn't have a compass, I could still figure out which directions are which using lots of different tricks. And one of them is using a wristwatch which I'm not wearing right now, but thankfully for me, I never let an old fashion from the 1980s and 90s die. I still wear a full-size clock around my neck wherever I go, and using this, I can figure out which direction is north. The way that you can use an analog clock to tell direction is that you take the hour hand on your clock and you point that towards the sun. Let's say the sun is in this direction. Once you've done that, you know that halfway between the hour hand and noon on the clock is south if you're in the northern hemisphere. If you're in the southern hemisphere, it's opposite. Let's uh, change the time on this clock to something different. Let's say it is half past four. If the sun is in this direction, you point the hour hand towards the sun, and halfway between the hour hand and noon, which is roughly this direction, is roughly south. And there are many other ways of telling direction without using a compass. One of them is if you're walking through a neighborhood and you see people that have those uh, direct TV kind of satellite dishes up on their roof, all of those satellite dishes here in the northern hemisphere are all pointed generally roughly southward. Not exactly southward, but generally in a southerly direction. So if you're going through a neighborhood and you see a bunch of those satellite dishes all pointing in one rough direction, you know that that rough direction is south. Now again, there are many different ways of telling north, south, east, and west without having a compass, but one other way that I wanted to talk about here, which references human-made structures, roads that you might be near if you're trying to navigate, is the road numbering system that we have here in the United States. Roads that have a number, if they are an odd number, they go north and south, and if they're an even number, they go east and west. Now that said, there may be sections of an east-west road that curve around something, and they may go north for a bit, and then uh, end up going south for a bit, but the general trajectory of even-numbered roads is east-west, and the general trajectory of odd-numbered roads is north-south. This is a U.S. Um, I think it has uh, Canada in here too, but this is like highways. This is if you were like really far away from home and you needed to get home and you need to kind of follow highways and your GPS isn't working because you know the satellites are down or you know who knows what the situation is. This would be able to get you from a far away location back to your home. But let's say you're kind of in your immediate area. Uh, you know you're not like hundreds of miles from home, you're just, you know, a few towns over, but you can't take your normal routes home. It's really important also to have local maps, street level local maps. Now the maps.me app that I mentioned has that, but I think it's important to have that kind of stuff in paper form so that you can kind of figure your way, you know, through back alleys or whatever you need to do to get yourself back home. Let's say your car just, you know, it's, it's inoperable. In a situation like an EMP, you know, your car might just not work. It doesn't matter how filled the tires are and how pristine all that is. You know, the electronics may die and you may not be able to travel in your vehicle or the roads could just be absolutely choked up. Let's say you're on the highway, it grinds to a standstill and it is just a parking lot and you can't go forward, you can't go back, you can't go to the side, you just can't get your car out. You have to hoof it home. And if you're going to do that, you need to be able to be able to move over landscape. You need to have clothing that's appropriate for that. You need to have footwear that's appropriate for that. I know for myself, whenever I leave the house, I'm always having like hiking boots on anyway. I know that not everybody does that. But if you aren't one of the people that always wears appropriate footwear for doing walking when you leave your house, it's really important to have that kind of stuff in your in your car, if you have some old uh, sneakers or something like that, that maybe they look kind of grungy, but you've gotten some new ones, put the old sneakers in there. I would highly recommend not putting new sneakers in there because new sneakers, they're going to take be a break-in period and you don't want to be in the middle of, the, of an emergency giving yourself blisters because you get brand new sneakers on. But have appropriate footwear and appropriate clothing on the outside. If it's winter, make sure you have the ability to be warm outside of your vehicle. That means a coat. If it's the middle of summer, you could have hard sun. Make sure you can cover up your skin, whether that's with sunblock or or with a long sleeve shirt. Um, and also, 
uh, a broad brimmed hat. I always uh, travel with a broad brimmed hat. I meant to have one here, uh, you know, for the video recording, but I always have a broad brimmed hat um, just to protect me from the sun. Not only is the sun really uncomfortable uh, if it's really hot and, and beating down on you, but it can give you like really, you know, medically concerning sunburns if you're out in that too long. So have appropriate clothing and appropriate footwear. Also, if you're not used to hiking over long distances, I think it's important to have something like trekking poles. Now, I never used to use trekking poles. I got into them recently because a few months ago, I majorly sprained my ankle and I, I didn't want it to slow me down. I still wanted to go hiking with my boy. So I got some trekking poles uh, so I could go on hikes with him and you know continue to let my ankle recover. And I found that they not only make it so that it's a lot easier uh, to move over terrain if you already have an injury, but they dramatically reduce the risk of you getting an injury. And if you're in an emergency situation, the last thing you want to be doing is having a hike home and then you like totally sprain your ankle. The reason for that is because uh, as you're just walking, you could walk on something that's a little bit unstable. You could stumble, you go to catch yourself, and then your other foot goes onto something unstable and you sprain uh, an ankle that way. If you have trekking poles, you have multiple points of contact with the ground and there's a much reduced chance that you're going to lose your balance and get some kind of a major sprain. They also distri distribute the workout into the rest of your body up into the arms. And, uh, you know, I just kind of like that in general. Uh, trekking poles like this, again, I'll put links down in the description below because I, I like these. Uh, these were like only 30 bucks. They weren't super expensive ones. They're collapsible. You could just keep those in your car, uh, especially if you're not the kind of person that is accustomed to doing long hikes. I'd recommend having hiking poles, especially if you have the next item that I'm going to talk about, which is an EDC backpack, which you might have on your back, which you may not be used to carrying around all the time. I always carry this thing around to keep myself uh, trained to, to have it on my back. But if you have extra weight on your back, you're gonna be much more likely to sprain an ankle. And I would recommend having some kind of an EDC pack. Now, I'm not gonna go into what's in this EDC pack because I have other videos on that. I'll put a link down in the description below to where I go through everything that's in this pack. Uh, I'll also put a card up here if uh, you know that's your preference. Uh, but I would highly recommend having some kind of an EDC pack that has critical items. Like this one has water in it. It has medical items in it. It has... Uh, uh, you know, food in here, there's granola bars in here. And I just use this on a daily basis because it has all sorts of things that I use regularly. I, I would say the things I go in here for most are probably my water bottle, uh, granola bars, and probably nail clippers occasionally. I want to keep my keys and my wallet in there as well. So I go after those a lot. So this is an EDC pack that has everyday normal stuff and it also has kind of things for an emergency. And I would highly recommend having something like that, uh, you know, so you have those extra items with you if you did need to hike home. And the very last thing that I want to talk about is unpopular here on YouTube, maybe I've waited long enough, is the ability to protect yourself. Uh, this is a car safe uh, that is uh, connected um, with a lock uh, here into my car and I can put a weapon in there, uh, you know, whatever might be legal in your area. Uh, now, when I'm going out, usually I will carry it on my person, but if, let's say you're in a situation where you have to travel through different states, especially up here in the Northeast, it is an absolute nightmare moving state to state because different states have different lo uh, laws rega regarding personal defense weapons. And uh, you can be a law-abiding, upstanding citizen in one state, and then you walk 10 feet into another state, and suddenly you're a felon, unless you have things locked up inside of your... Uh, your lockbox in the car as you're as you're driving around. So I would recommend having a lockbox if you have a personal protective weapon and you're going to be moving across state lines. It makes it safer for you to do that kind of traveling in a legal sense. Uh, I think it's kind of silly that we even have that concern. I think the Second Amendment is really cut and dry when it comes to people's ability to. Uh, you know, use tools to protect themselves. It's a great um, empowering, uh, leveling equality uh, creator, uh, having the ability for even small people, uh, you know, smaller women to be able to defend themselves from really large men. If we did get rid of all those types of uh, tools in our society, uh, you know, a lot of people think that suddenly we'd all be safe, but suddenly the situation would be that all the small people are completely at the mercy of all the, the big bulky people that uh, you know, want to take advantage of the fact that they are just born with a weapon on their body. So uh, you know, uh, I'm getting a little bit off onto a political tangent here because the whole thing just really bothers me, especially living up here in New England. I think it's, it's irritating that I have to, when the Second Amendment is just so clear on it. So uh, I'm still really sore about it. But whatever the law, uh, laws are in your area, whatever your comfort level is, have some ability to protect yourself because uh, when things go crazy, when the shit hits the fan, uh, people tend to lose their shit pretty quickly. Uh, sometimes these emergency situations elevate people to be their best. 
uh, but quite often it uh, does the opposite and you need to be able to protect yourself and your family if you are moving across an area trying to get yourself home uh, from people who might uh, be taking advantage of the situation in a negative way. Whatever you do, Think, uh, give it some thought, uh, you know, have some plans uh, in mind, you know, whether you take my advice on the things I have here, maybe you have some other ideas, leave any uh, thoughts you have in the comments below about things you think maybe I've missed in this video, but it's really important to be able, whenever you go out in your vehicle, to be prepared to possibly come back without it. That's it, and thanks for watching. Hey YouTube preppers, if you enjoyed this video, here's another that I think you might like. But before you click on it, I wanted to take a moment to thank all the people you see on the right hand side of your screen. They help to support all the work that I do here over at Patreon.com. If you'd like to join them and get your name added to the list, the link's below.